My name is John Van Nortwick, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Marine Corps, retired, served in the Marine Corps for 22 years from 1954 until 1976. I was awarded the Legion of Merit for uh, my time in Vietnam. America is at war. I was born in Geneva, Illinois in November 11th, 1933, 1947. I moved to California permanently with my mother. My initial experiences at college, not very good, and I dropped out of college in uh, 1954 after two years and enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps. Upon enlistment, I went to MCRD San Diego, and uh, while there, a presentation team came through trying to recruit enlisted Marines for a program called the Naval Aviation Cadet Program, NAVCAD program. So I applied and kept getting accepted and passing the various tests and physicals. Discharged from the Marine Corps, enlisted in the Navy as a Naval Aviation Cadet, went through flight training in the Pensacola area. At that time, I had not really thought about staying in the Marine Corps. Ever since the helicopter became a practical operational aircraft, new uses for it have been discovered by every branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. The Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines all have found that for certain jobs, you just can't beat a helicopter. Helicopters were a brand new thing. It just kind of appeared. So I thought I would learn to fly helicopters, go off and fly in South America and meet beautiful women and make a lot of money. Uh, never happened, but uh, I did uh, take the helicopter route and uh, became a helicopter pilot. 1956, my first assignment was uh, in New River, North Carolina to Marine Helicopter Transport Squadron 263. Well, I started out on, uh, I believe it was called an HTL-13. Best way to describe it is you remember the old MASH television programs the helicopters that, that were in that program is what I started flying in. Proceeded through advanced helicopter training and flew the HUP-2, H-U-P-2, which was a tandem rotor helicopter with the Navy then, and it's what we trained in. When I was commissioned and uh, went to 263 in New River, I flew HRS-1 and HRS-3 helicopters. Many of them that are in my logbook were helicopters that flew in Korea. After a year at New River, I was transferred to uh, Opama, Japan, HMR-163, an HRS squadron. While I was there, I met a man who greatly influenced my life. His ma name was Major Jim Dorsey, and he was the uh, XO of that squadron, and he you know, took an interest in me and asked me if I ever had thought about staying in the Marine Corps. I said, I didn't know that anybody stayed in the Marine Corps. Kind of a dumb statement, but you know. He said, well, I think that uh, seem to like the Marine Corps and the Marine Corps seems to like you. So perhaps you'd like to apply for a regular commission, which I did. And then I had been accepted as a regular officer and I was a first lieutenant at that time. Changed the designation about that time to HMM, and it was HMM 264, and uh, I started flying H-34s. In about February of 1961, I was transferred to HMX at Quantico. I uh, started flying the VH-34. HMX now has evolved to entirely the White House mission. I had also at that time just recently gotten married. Sonia and I moved to Quantico, got my White House clearance, flew the Marine One mission many, many times, flew President Kennedy many, many times, and President Johnson. Part of the White House mission, and I think this is common knowledge now, involves an alert facility at the old Anacostia Naval Air Station, 
which involves evacuation of the White House in the event of attack. Those were the Cold War years. Our mission was uh, to be airborne within three minutes of receiving an alert, evacuate the president and the family and the staff uh, to an alternate location. And it was a, real, a very real thing then. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. I uh, went on duty the morning after President Kennedy gave his Cuban missile speech on TV. Had a very unfortunate incident. <laughs> Uh, everybody screws up in their uh, in their careers, and I did that. I was the co-pilot on a VH-34. We had an, what they call an Opal drill uh, that morning. We went on duty at seven o'clock in the morning. It was about eight o'clock when we had a drill. Raced out to the helicopters. I climbed up the left side. Pilot climbed up the right side. The drill was that while the pilot was strapping in, the co-pilot would reach across, start the engine of the helicopter using the, the boosted throttle on the pilot's collective. I screwed it up, oversped the engine. Seven other helicopters taxied out and took off, and we sat there on the ramp. I was able to make up for that mistake many years later. We just flew many, many missions all over the United States and in, in several foreign countries uh, with the president. Certainly exciting. We had very strict instructions. For instance, if I was in the left seat of a VH3 and the door's right here, I wouldn't turn around and look at them. You weren't, you'd just look straight ahead, you know, and uh, very professional, very Marine-like. President Kennedy in particular was a very warm, nice, friendly person. On several occasions, we would be at Camp David there's a large field house there that is essentially a helicopter hangar that you can put two spread VH3s in. When I say spread, with their blades are spread. With some recreational facilities there, basketball courts. And the president used to come down and shoot baskets with us. A interesting event took place one morning. We were out on the ramp preparing to fly back to Washington uh, after we spent the weekend at Camp David. Uh, and I was standing under the tail rotor of the VH-3 that I was the co-pilot in, which at that, I think that was the lead aircraft that weekend, it was. And uh, tail order blades started to move. The aircraft was cold, it wasn't plugged in, so I did, really didn't know why that was happening. So I walked up front, climbed the stairs, and looked in the cockpit to see what was going on. The president was sitting there. His son, John, was sitting here. And the president was, was giving him a flying lesson teaching him how to fly a helicopter. Uh, Mr. President, is there anything I can do to help you? No thanks, Captain, we're doing just fine. Yes, sir. <laughs> the President used to go to Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. There's an island in Booth Bay Harbor that is owned by uh, the old prize fighter whose name was Gene Tunney. And the president would go up there with his friends and they just have boys weekend out. The Coast Guard had a four masted schooner from New London, Connecticut that they would sail up there and the president would go out on sail on that boat. Now I was on part of one of the alert crews. We, were, we would stand by and I got wakened at about three o'clock in the morning to fly uh, down to Logan Airport in Boston and pick up three passengers coming in on the American Airlines Red Eye from Los Angeles. Our three passengers were Peter Lawford, the actor, and two very, very attractive women. Do not know who they were. They always asked me if one was Marilyn Monroe. Happy birthday, Mr. President. One was not. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> Mr. Lawford, unfortunately, had uh, gotten very drunk on board the red eye from Los Angeles, and they uh, got on board the president's helicopter and threw up. So. <laughs> Friday, 10 minutes before noon, 
The motorcade begins the 11-mile ride to the Dallas Trademark, where the president is to deliver a major address. We had, and I believe it was the Secret Service who had requested this, wanted to establish what the squadron would need to move to a completely austere location somewhere. And I worked in the, in the S4 shop, the logistics office. My boss sent me up to the station dispensary, the medical building, to talk with them to, to build a list of medical supplies that the squadron would take with them should we be transferred to this austere site. Somebody ran in the door and said, he's been shot. He's been shot. Everybody said, what, the president has been shot. So I said, well, I better get back down to the squadron. So I stopped doing that down the street to the squadron, got in the squadron, talking about going back to Anacostia. And we alternated between taking a white top and a normal plain cargo H-34, not a VIP one. And this decision-making thing went back and forth, back and forth several times. We did end up taking a white top back up there. Uh, the reason for that was, of course, they were saying the president's coming back to town and everybody's saying, Oh. A pair of men have just administered the last rites of the Catholic Church to President Kennedy. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. The president is dead. They hadn't really uh, realized that the, that the president was now President Johnson. The reason for talking about taking what we would call his a stake, which is what they called the cargo helicopters, was the requirement to move the president's body from uh, Andrews to Bethesda. And at one thought time, the thought was he would be moved by helicopter. We ended up back on duty at Anacostia, assumed the alert duty with a white top. A friend of mine ended up with a stake on the ramp at Andrews. And if you remember the picture of them removing the president's casket from Air Force One and there was an ambulance sitting there. They originally thought that my friend, whose name is Ted Reed, was going to fly the president's uh, body to Bethesda. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy said, no, I don't want to go by helicopter. I want, I want to go by ambulance. Therefore, the change was made there on the ramp. And he did end up going by ambulance and the, pre the, pre the helicopter was not used. It was interesting times. I mean, you know, uh, I remember we finally, my wife and I got out of the house a couple of days later after watching all this stuff on television and went over to the Quantico golf course to play golf. And we were walking off the eighth green and somebody ran by saying, they just shot Harvey Oswald. And uh, so we were sort of witnesses to a lot of that, that history. And this is President Johnson and the First Lady, Mrs. Johnson, stepping out of the helicopter on the White House lawn. Completed my uh, almost four years at, at HMX. About that time, the Vietnam War, War was starting to crank up. Both our boys were born at the Naval Hospital in Quantico. And I was being transferred back to the, quote, real Marine Corps. They had this program. They, they needed to, quote, sanitize you after you served with HMX. Theoretically, you couldn't go to any foreign country or any place where you might be compromised with information about the White House. By that time, I was a captain in the Marine Corps. I was sent to the uh, junior officer school at Quantico for nine months. Then had orders to uh, the third Marine aircraft wing at, uh, out in Ca at El Toro, California. And I figured I had been in helicopters long enough and I needed to m move on. So I had, marine aviation is a very small community and you can, a lot of deals are done through friendship and everything. So I was going to transition into C-130s at El Toro. They had just received a warning order to move the whole helicopter air group at MAG-36 at Tustin to move them to Vietnam in the, within the next month. So not only was I in C-130s, I was staying in helicopters and they were digging all the rest of the people out of their jobs in the wing to, to flesh out the squadrons at MAG-36. 
We intend to convince the communists that we cannot be defeated by force of arms or by superior power. They are not easily convinced. In recent months, they have greatly increased their fighting forces and their attacks and the numbers of incidents. I have asked the commanding general, General Westmoreland, what more he needs to meet this mounting aggression. He has told me, and we will meet his needs. My wife was standing on the pier in Long Beach holding on to a three-month-old and a three-year-old as I sailed off on the USS Princeton headed for Vietnam. Offloaded at Da Nang, I was in HMM 363. The lucky red lion is on the nose. They had a contest with all the enlisted crew chiefs and everything, and somebody got it off of a bottle of Australian beer. So <laughs> that's what Marines do. So <laughs> I, I remember standing on the flight deck of the Princeton uh, the day we arrived off of Da Nang and looking over there, and it just, there it was. It took a little while to get acclimated. We ended up being sent south to Quinion, which is down in the, actually right in the, almost in the center of South Vietnam. The northern anchor of the Army's logistical chain is the burgeoning port and depot complex of Quinion. Serving the hyperactive two core area, the T shaped DeLong Pier at Quinion is crammed with cargo on its way to the coastal plains and the central highlands. For many months, this port and depot has handled the largest tonnages in Vietnam. The 1st Brigade of the 101st Airborne was down there, and we were in, flew in direct support of the Airborne. The Airborne left and the Koreans came in, and we continued to fly for the Koreans. They had thought that the Viet Cong, NVA, were going to cut the country in two right through Quinyan. So they wanted to protect that port, and that's also where the 1st Cav was going to come in to move ashore up into Pleiku. We also flew what we called strike missions, which involved going out and finding the bad guys and going after them. A typical day for members of a Marine medium helicopter squadron in Vietnam usually starts quietly, but rarely continues that way. The first time I was, was wounded was uh, on one of those missions. We were flying 101st Airborne troops into a rice paddy area where the VC were supposed to be. Well, they were there, essentially right in the middle of their breakfast, big firefight started on the ground there. Bullet came through the side of the helicopter and hit me in the, in the leg right here, right behind my knee. I said, I've been hit. And we had like, probably 18, 20 H-34s on this mission. There was another aircraft that had somebody gotten wounded in. Two of us, we flew back to the airfield at Quinion. The others continued to do the mission. It was completed. I landed at the, at the airstrip. Somebody put me in a Jeep and took me to an army aid station. The GI doctors looked at me and kind of patched it up and, and said, probably best you just let the Navy take care of it. I, they didn't want to screw with it. Bullet is still there. Never took it out, left it in. We moved on down to Tuiwa and uh, opened another area down there, again with the Koreans. And then we moved back to Chulai in February of 1966. And this, kind of gets to be an interesting story. There was no R&R program at that time, that early in the war. And the only way that they were able to get air crew out of the country and just get them just a little time off was to send them to the Philippines to jungle survival school. Here we are in Vietnam doing our thing and they send us to the Philippines to jungle survival school. So I, anyway, uh, got back to the squadron. Uh, it had been raining, the place was a mess. I, you know, we were still sleeping in tents and everything. Checked in with a duty officer and he said, well, we got a big kind of all hands on deck. You're good to fly and everything. I said, sure. Made my way down to the squadron operations area that next morning at about five o'clock in the morning. When I had left, I left my flight gear, my hard hat, my flak vest, my survival gear, all that stuff. And while I was gone, Somebody needed my regular flak vest more than I did. Uh, it was nothing bad intended, it was just somebody needed something at the time. And we were in a hurry. The only flak vest I could find to wear was a double XL. And if I wore it and 
zippered it up, I was like the Michelin man, like this. Climbed up into the 34, into Yankee Zulu 68. Anyway, flew very a lot of different missions that say some medevac resupply, uh, one or two strikes. And anyway, at the end of the day, about six o'clock in the evening, the group was released to return to Chulai. And I was leading a, a two-plane section. I was a section leader of two helicopters. You know, with the briefing, I said, what's the best way to get back? What's been going on? He said, it's been quiet. Uh, head out to Highway 1, this Highway 1 that ran up and down Vietnam. Head out to Highway 1, turn right, fly on down July. Should You know, and the weather was about a 1,000 foot broken, a little bit of rain and everything like that. Uh, so we're chugging along about 100 knots, probably at about, I don't know, five, 600 feet uh, AGL, just under the cloud deck. And just outside the, uh, the perimeter at Chulai, bang, 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 somebody hosed us down with an automatic weapon. Later on, when we got it on the ground, we counted 28 holes. A round came through the instrument panel and hit me in the chest right here. Knocked me back into the seat. Of course, I had my hand on the, on the um, cyclic and something from the instrument panel came through through my glove, through this fleshy part of my finger right here, and pinned my hand to the stick. I'm yelling at the co-pilot, I'm saying, I got hit, I got hit, and all kinds of junk flying around the cockpit and everything, and fortunately we didn't run into our wingman. He, he said, you know, let go of the stick, I got it. I said, I'm trying to, I finally jerked my hand loose, you know, it was just a little thing. But anyway, the bullet came through here, and I remember looking down at this flak vest, and there was a hole in it and smoke was coming out of the hole. And I said, man, I just been shot in the chest. I should feel something. Well, I didn't. I got a lot of shrapnel and stuff in my arm here and uh, tore me up pretty good. So the co-pilot flew it into the medevac pad and climbed up the co-pilot co and the crew chief and Navy corpsman climbed upside to start to help me getting out. The round had gone through the flak vest. We pulled it back and it had dented the other layer of the flak vest that was underneath and bounced off of the round was laying on the deck between my feet. In my way, I'm a very religious man. God saved my life that day. There's no doubt about it. <clears throat> I get a little sentimental. Got uh, medevaced out, uh, out through, uh, up to Da Nang, over to Clark in the Philippines, then into uh, Air Force Base near San Francisco, where I finally was able to get on a telephone and call my wife and tell her what had happened. And I was being transferred to the Balboa Naval Hospital in San Diego. I was wounded in my arm. I'd been wounded in the neck and some other stuff. Talked my way out of the hospital. I went and I said, look, I'm walking. My family is right up the road in Costa Mesa, California. How about letting me go up there and see them? I'll come back down here and whatever you want me to do. Well. They let me do that. I was attached to the hospital for six weeks, but I never spent a night there. I went, I was able to go home. And I came down there every other day, drove from Costa Mesa to San Diego for them to do whatever they needed to do. I started going to night school at uh, Chapman College. You qualify for it, they would give you a year off to finish your college. So I, at the end of my two, two years at MHTG 30, uh, I did nine months at Chapman College getting my BA. Graduated from Chapman, I went home and I had a, a parcel there from the Marine Corps with my orders back overseas to Vietnam. In April of 1969, and I was assigned, to the, had orders to the 1st Marine Aircraft Wing, which was uh, located at Da Nang. And from there I went to MAG-16 at the Marble Mountain Air Facility, which is also in the Da Nang area, and checked into MAG-16, where all my old friends were, everybody I knew. When we went over the first time in 65, we thought we were, we were fighting the VC, the Viet Cong, the guerrillas. The second time I went back, we were very definitely fighting the North Vietnamese Army, without a doubt. There isn't much question that the year 1968 was the turning point of the American part of the war in Vietnam. The Tet Offensive shattered a lot of illusions, illusions about pacification and body count, and about computer printouts that were telling us we were winning the war when in fact we were not. It wasn't more of a set piece war or stuff. It was certainly uh, 
more dangerous. You know, they had they had better guns then and better, you know, uh, we were taking a lot of casualties. So anyway, I could check into MAG-16 at Marble Mountain uh, and I get assigned to HMM-263, which was the very first squadron I was in the Marine Corps many years prior. Hell, I knew everybody there. I was just like old home week. I was the S-1 officer. I didn't know anything about being S-1 officer. Of course, they had a lot of really good enlisted people working for me, so they did it, but I didn't stay the S-1 very long because two days after I checked in uh, to the squadron, the S-3 of the squadron, the operations officer, Bernie Terhorst, was killed. He was hoisted a medevac out of uh, an area called Charlie Ridge, which is south and west of Da Nang, and got hosed down pretty badly. Uh, had all his hydraulics shot out, kept it flying for a while till it, till all the hydraulics blowed off and rolled inverted and went in and they were gone. I'll be very honest with you, I really had some doubts as to whether I could continue doing this. It was scary, scary times. I obviously continued to do what I was doing and flew, flew 46s and uh, flew some really, really gratifying stuff then. We flew a lot of medevacs. We were, uh, the Marine Corps does not have a, a dust off program like the Army has. Uh, the Army has dedicated medevac helicopters. Marine Corps, it's the squadrons, the transport squadrons have that duty. There were three H-46 squadrons on the base at Marble. So every third day, we had a 24 hour cycle of being of flying the medevac mission. And I was the three of the squadron and then I was, the, I moved up and I was the XO of the squadron. And so I pretty much decided when and where I wanted to fly. So I flew a lot of the medevac. I signed myself to fly a lot of the medevac and a lot of the night medevac. I believe I was instrumental in, in helping save a, a lot of Marines lives. And I felt pretty good about that. And uh, got into a lot of hairy stuff, a lot of shooting, never was wounded again. I was, uh, uh, my 46 was shot down one time. I had one hydraulic partially shot out, but got it on the ground, landed it, got it on the ground, and we didn't crash, fortunately. Well, I was was just flying a, a routine resupply mission one day, and we got diverted that for an emer what they called an emergency extract of a recon team. They put these recon, six man, eight man recon teams out in the, out in the boonies, you know, and they were supposed to stay out there, snoop and poop around, be quiet, you know, watch the enemy. But they all the time ran into trouble. They all the time got into fights and everything like that. So we had to, uh, we got called on this emergency act, extract of this of this team in the Quezon Mountains. And uh, so we went in there and they were, they had two wounded. They'd, they'd come head to head with an NVA patrol. They had two wounded. They had killed three NVA. The first guys there were, were a couple of Cobras and uh, they, th they thought that I would have to hoist these guys out. And I said, man, we're, you know, we're dead meat if we, we have to hoist them out. If we try and find a place we can put this bird down. And so we did, we found a, a, a kind of an outcropping of things where I could put this 46 down. I was able to put the left main gear down on an old bomb crater on, on the side of this hill. The recon team was up the hill behind us. My crew chief and one of the gunners, I had a crew chief and two gunners, one of the gunners went out the back, out the ramp, went up the hill. They were, they were gone 20 minutes till they reached the recon team, which was coming down the hill with, with their wounded. And, they, and this guy's crew chief's name was Lit Lemuel Penn. I remember him very well. They got down, down there, down the ramp. We were, there was a lot of shooting going on, but we were kind of in, somehow we were in defilade. The bad guys couldn't, it's all the stuff was going over our heads. And uh, the one gunner was shooting back still at somebody down there. And, and uh, so by that time we had two Cobras, two OV-10s and, and, and a flight of F-4s hanging around up. And uh, so I finally got everybody on board. So I talked to the Cobra guys and, and I said, all right, I'm gonna start coming out here. And if you'll, you know, they would start coming in and make parallel runs, there's one on each side of me as I came out. We worked it out, it worked out good. We came out, we never took a hole, we never took a hit. Uh, the Cobras 
shooting up everything beside us. And they, I never saw it because I was, we were headed out. Finally took my feet off the pedals. The co pilot says, you know, you take it for a while. <laughs> he said the whole damn mountainside lit up when, after we forgot of, of people shooting at us, but we never, never got hit and we got those guys out. So I, uh, I had a friend who was uh, uh, the CEO of the Cobra Squadron. The Marine Corps had one Cobra Squadron, and they were all Army Cobras that had been painted Marine Corps green, and they changed the radios in them and put in a rotor brake. And that's all. They were still Army Cobras. Anyway, this friend of mine uh, is the CEO of the Cobra Squadron. He says, hey, would you like to fly with us? I said, sure, that'd be great. So I got, I got about 25 hours in the front seat of a Cobra. So that's the first time. I ever got to shoot back. And I don't know if he ever hit anything, but it was the first time I got to shoot back. I, so while I was in the group there, I, uh, my last couple of months, I, I snivelled some time with the Cobras and, and, uh, and also the Huey Squadron. I majored in the Marine Corps by then. For whatever it's worth, uh, I was awarded the Legion of Merit for uh, that year and my time in Vietnam. And went back to California, picked up the family, transferred to Hawaii. We were moved to Hawaii on the last cruise of the USS Lurleen, uh, which is a ship that used to go between San Francisco and Honolulu. It checked into uh, the Marine Corps Air Station at Kaneohe Bay on Oahu, and I ended up being the XO of the headquarters squadron there in, at the station. Essentially, we owned all the people that ran the base. And while I was there, my wife said, maybe you should think about going back to school again now that you you know, I, I was kind of non-deployable having the station job. So the University of Southern California has an extension at Hickam Air Force Base. And I ended up for about a, well, a little over a year going to night school there. And I got a uh, master's degree in, in aviation systems management. My friend Walt Ledbetter is the CEO of Marine Heavy Helicopter Squadron 463 which is a CH-53 squadron that had just come back from Vietnam that was part of MAG-24 at Kaneohe. And he said, John, he said, uh, this is a very small community. Uh, he said, what did you think about coming down here and being my EXO and then taking the squadron? I said, hey, Jesus, well, of course I would. He said, well, you're gonna get orders from the station to the 1st Marine Brigade, which is the FMF unit there and hence to MAG-24. And so I went down there and became the XO of HMH-463 flying CH-53s. Prior to becoming the XO, I had exactly an hour and a half in the cockpit of an H-53. But uh, they all fly the same way, so. 1972 is at the end of the Vietnam War. It was all winding down. We were on the end of the food chain there. For, we, were, we, were, we were a 21 aircraft squadron. I only never had more than 16, 15, 16 aircraft. You know, there just wasn't enough stuff to go around, parts or anything. Uh, we were lucky to get four up in the morning, four up in the afternoon, you know, and just flew. For a while, we were the only heavy lift capability in the islands. The Army wasn't back yet and everything. So we were working for everybody there. I mean, I, I hauled stuff for the University of Hawaii. I, some sort of a scientific team, fly over the, the volcanoes at Kilauea, and uh, they were taking readings and stuff like that. I get a call from a good friend of mine who works over at, at uh, FMF PAC, which was the Fleet Marine Force headquarters on the other side of the island. And he said, he said, John, he said, uh, how's your embark status? And his name was George Bailey. And I said, George, I says, it sucks. He said, well, you might be getting on top of it and uh, you might be thinking about getting ready. And he said, I can't tell you anything more than that. Well, two days later, the group CO, this was a, a funny group. It was a composite air group. It had two F-4 squadrons, an H-46 squadron, and an H-53 squadron. I had the H-53 squadron. I was still a major at that time. The group CO called me in and they said, the squadron's going to be de deployed next week back to the Philippines. I said, okay. And he said, I can't tell you why. And uh, it was all had to do with the end of the Vietnam War. The CH-53, when it was purchased from Sikorsky, fuselage hardpoints built in to accept minesweeping gear. 
sweeping mines by helicopter. This is the, the Mark 105 magnetic sweep. The arms that you see sticking up in the air are actually hydrofoils. When the uh, device is used to sweep mines, the helicopter will uh, be uh, connected by this tow cable that you see here. It will pull the device into the water. Once it is waterborne, the foils will put down in a down position and lock. And at speeds of uh, 13 to 15 knots, it will come out of the water and ride on the hydrofoils. And the passage of this current sets up a magnetic field about the rig that uh, simulates the magnetic signature of the, uh, of the target that the mine was uh, designed to detonate against. And that is not a Marine Corps mission, and we don't even know how to do it, or didn't know how to do it. A couple of C-5s arrived from the mainland with enough parts and stuff on it to put all 16 of our aircraft up. Very secret. I couldn't, it was, you know, you couldn't talk to anybody about where you were going or what you were doing. Yet, the USS Inchon, which is an LPH, a helicopter ship, went up into the channel between Oahu and Kauai, and we flew aboard all 16 sometime in November middle of November, I think, of 72, and proceeded to the Philippines. With the help of the Navy, train ourselves to become proficient in doing this and towing this mine sweeping gear through the water, which would clear the mines, detonate them, so on. So we built a training syllabus, trained ourselves, taught ourselves how to do it. And then we were supposed to train the, the MAG-36 pilots to come and we were trained them, train that squadron. Truth be told, and I think this is common knowledge now. Uh, it was all theatrical. The mines that the Navy had laid in Haiphong Harbor had either gone inert or had self-detonated. The Navy only detonated one. We did not detonate any. The Navy lost one aircraft. We lost two mechanical, both of them. Uh, one while I was the CO of the squadron. My XO was backing off an LPD, he would then do a pedal turn and pull the minesweeping gear off the ramp and go do his thing. He's backing off, pitch link in the tail rotor broke, failed tail rotor blade, went out of sync, pulled the gearbox out of the, out of the housing, cut the tail off, rolled inverted, went to the bottom of Haiphong Harbor, 90 feet down. All six of them swam to the surface. They, kicked, they were good, they got out. I left before they finished the job. They, had, they went up into Vin and a few other places. From there, I went to command and staff college at Quantico. Did uh, nine months, 10 months there. And then was reported to uh, Division of Aviation Headquarters Marine Corps. I was the helicopter plans and programs coordinator in Division of Aviation. And that was in 1975 and 1976. But I had been promoted to Lieutenant Colonel then. I had gotten to know the Commandant of the Marine Corps fairly well from Hawaii and everything, General Wilson. And I was, I guess, his go-to guy on helicopters there. So he called me to the front of the building one day and he said, we've got a, uh, a memo here from the Department of Defense. So at that time, both the Army and the Marines were flying the, the White House mission. There were Army helicopters doing it, there were White Tops, and there were Marines. Although the helicopters themselves were all VH-3s, which were Navy aircraft. And he said, I want you to tell me about HMX and I want you to, I want to know, know what's going on. We have to make a decision if we want to fight for the mission, if we want to keep the mission. So I be told him best I could, the good and the bad. You know, I mean, it's very high visibility, obviously great publicity for the Marine Corps. It's a big drawdown on personnel. I mean, the, the quality of the people at HMX is very high. You could staff a whole air wing with the people that are down there. So after me talking to him for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, he looks at me and John, he says, we want the mission and you're the guy who's gonna make it happen. <laughs> and she so says, you have an appointment with a, an assistant secretary of defense down at the Pentagon to brief him on this and convince him that the Marine Corps keeps the mission. He said, put your uniform on with all your ribbons and all that stuff and go on down there. So I began to brief him and explained it to him and we got the mission. That's why the Marines are flying Marine One today. I had a small part in making that happen. I've been in 22 years. I had two teenage sons. 
uh, we lived down in, in uh, outside of Quantico. I'd build a house down there. Began to think, God, you know, I've been on the road. I've been away from my family uh, so much. So I started about thinking about uh, putting in my letter. Decided to go ahead and put the letter in. I did. And my monitor, and the monitor is a, in this case was a Marine Brigadier General who kind of just kind of watches your career go along, you know, and advises you. He came down to my office and he says, what the hell are you doing? You know, he said, you're slated for Newport next year. And I said, Newport is the Naval War College. And he said, we don't send people to the Naval War College that we don't intend to promote to Colonel, full Colonel, I was a Lieutenant Colonel. So I want you to think about it, are you, you know, do you really, you want to pull your letter or you want to leave it in? And I went home and said, went back and forth with my wife that decided to retire. I just decided I needed to spend some time with my family. And uh, so I put the letter in. And fortunately I did because if I had not, and I had gone to Naval War College and had I been promoted to Colonel, I wouldn't have come here to El Paso. I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have the five granddaughters I've got. Things would have gone in another direction. So in the long run, it worked out the right way. This particular helicopter uh, is a replica of an H-30 floor I was flying in Vietnam. Very rugged old bird, it'll come home with a lot of holes in it. It served the purpose, it saved an awful lot of lives in Vietnam. I'm still a Marine through and through, and always will be, and uh, I'm very thankful. God has treated me very well. I'm a very, very fortunate person. Well, this is a completely different story. It does not involve me. It involves somebody else. We had a crew chief in the, in the squadron. His name was Mike Clausen. He was an excellent crew chief. He was a terrible Marine. He couldn't get promoted until he got in a fight and got busted. You know, he was a permanent PFC, but he was a very, very brave man. The CEO of the squadron that then, a guy named uh, Walt Ledbetter, who's a very good friend of mine, lives in Hilton Head. I just saw him about a year ago. Uh, was flying, was CO, and this Marine patrol had wandered into a minefield on the outskirts of Da Nang. And they were in this minefield, and they were obviously taking casualties. So Walt had to, was on the mission that day, landed in the minefield. Why he didn't sell off any mines, I'll never know. Clausen went out the back and brought in 13 or 14 either wounded or KIA Marines. And at one time Walt ordered, he was on a long cord, Walt ordered him back in the helicopter and Clausen took his hard hat off and threw it in the helicopter so he couldn't hear the order, went back out and got another, got another wounded guy and brought him back in and won the Medal of Honor for it.